For our scripture passage today, we're going to continue looking at Peter's first letter. And we've called this the, uh, the travel guide for exiles. Because in this uh, letter, Peter is giving us our advice and how that we should live as exiles of God. As in we're living here in this world where we don't truly belong as we're waiting uh, for Christ to, re- to come and for all of his promises to be revealed to us and for us to find our true home, our true place, and even our true time. Uh, before we begin, let us pause for a moment in prayer. Good and glorious Father, you have given us your spirit to guide us and direct, to direct us and to shepherd our steps. And Lord, you have given us this holy word, your own scripture, written and inspired by your Holy Spirit. And Father, these truths that are embedded in here can only be revealed, we know, if that same spirit that inspired these words would guide us still today. So we ask, Lord, that spirit be upon our minds to instruct us, to teach us, to open our minds to the truth that you have revealed here to us. Father, bless this holy reading of your holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I want you to imagine with me, if you would, for a moment, that you are the owner of this rare and beautiful vineyard. It's a, uh, let's say, a hundred acres of choice grape-growing land, these beautiful rolling hills, these nice abundant vines that are, that are just heavy with fruit every year. And what's even better about this, this vineyard, because of the grapes that are grown there and the particular type of earth and the climate you have, that every year this produces a grape that's unlike any other in the world. It's a -a one-of-a-kind grape. You can't get it anywhere else. And so if you harvest this grape and and you make wine out of it, it produces this vintage that you can't get anywhere else. Uh, It it is unique, and and, and it's lovely, and it's wonderful. So, So imagine for me, you've got this vineyard, and it produces these grapes that produces this unique wine. And you're going to give this vineyard to a friend. You're going to give him 100 acres of this choice grape wine producing vineyard. You're going to just give it to a friend of yours. And you tell this friend, listen, I'm going to give it to you free and clear. This is yours. I've only got two conditions. Two conditions, right? I want you to use it well. Take this vineyard, use it well. And the second condition is make sure people know that I gave it to you. That's it. It's yours. Yours to produce, to do what you want with it. Just use it well and let people know that I gave it to you. All right, so imagine you've done this. You've got this, this, choice, this choice wine producing vineyard and you've given it to a friend with only these, these two conditions. And let's say you come back 10 years later and you see that the whole farm has fallen in disrepair. That weeds are growing up between the vines, the trellises are rotting and they're falling apart. Some of the vines themselves have even died from lack of care and nutrition. And that the only grapes that are produced are these these small, almost half-diseased things. And you can take one look at this vineyard and you can tell this friend that you gave it to has done nothing with it at all. What would your reaction be? What would would your thoughts be about this? What would some words be that come to your mind when thinking about this friend who has taken your gift and done nothing with it? Probably ungrateful would be one of the first words that came to mind. Wasteful, that'd be another one. You look and say that they, they, they squandered this great opportunity to do something wonderful. Another way of putting it is that they were not good stewards of what was given to them. They were given this wonderful gift and they were not good stewards of the gift that they were given. In our passage today, the apostle Peter talks about us being good stewards of the grace we were given. In this passage, he tells us to be good stewards, he says, of the varied grace that God has given you. 
And in fact, he's given us several kinds of grace that he is, he's given us and poured into our hearts. And this gift of grace is like a priceless treasure that's placed in our hands. It's just like this vineyard that I described to you a few moments ago. It is, it is something priceless, it's unique, and yet it can produce something wonderful if we put just a little bit of work and effort into it. And God has given us these gifts. He has given us this grace, this priceless grace, and He's only asked two things from us. Put this to good use and give me the credit and the glory and the honor for this grace that I have given you. So He's given all of this, this treasure. All of this, all of us, this priceless treasure. And the question we have to ask is what have we done with it? He's given us the gift of grace and the gift of salvation. Have you used it well? So that's what Peter is talking about here in this part of his letter, being stewards of the grace that he has given us. He starts out right here in verse 1. He says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So here, right here, what Peter's doing, he's recalling to us the grace that God has given us. Christ has suffered in the flesh. And that is how we received our forgiveness. And that is how we received our grace. Because Christ has suffered in the flesh for us. So what that means for us now, our suffering in the flesh has new meaning. Or you could probably say our suffering in the flesh now has meaning. Because without the suffering of Christ, our suffering in the flesh is meaningless. Whatever suffering it is, whether it's just the, uh, you know, the aches and pains of old age, of getting sick, of getting injured, of, of being oppressed by injustice or, or crime, or just think of any kind of suffering you go through, it's pointless suffering if Christ didn't first suffer. Without Christ, without an eternal life, without God here looking over us and shepherding this world, all of our suffering is meaningless. But now that Christ has suffered and we've been given this grace, what happens first is now our suffering means something. Now our suffering has a purpose. Now there's, there's something that comes out of this instead of just awful, plain, meaningless suffering. Now something good can come out of it. And we says the first thing that good that comes out of us is now that we can be free from the passions and now serve the will of God. Is to no longer, as he says, no longer live the rest of the time in the flesh for human passions. But now we can live our time in the flesh for the will of God. Now, when he says human passions, he's talking about these desires and these urges of the body. And, and they're not bad. In and of themselves, these passions are not bad. We need things like hunger that shows us we need food. We need urges like thirst that tells the body it's time to drink. We even need the urges of our sexuality because, well, if you don't like to, even if you don't like to think about it, that's how we all got here. Okay, these passions, they're not bad in and of themselves. It's when we're ruled by the passions that they become evil. It's when these passions rule over us and they direct us and move us and tell us what to do, that's when those passions become evil. It's when we use these passions or seek them out in a way that God has not intended to, in a way that God has forbidden us from seeking them out, that's when the passions become bad. That's when these passions become evil. But he says, because of Christ's suffering, and through your suffering, you're now free from having these passions. Not of having the passions, sorry, but being ruled over by them. You've been given this freedom. Our sin is no longer telling us what to do. Now we are free to decide. It's the grace of God that has done this. It's the grace of God that has freed us from these things so we don't have to live like we're animals anymore, ruled over by our passions and our desires and urges. I mean, you think about your dog, no matter how much you love your dog, how great that dog is, they're ruled by passions and urges. I don't care how well you've trained the dog, if you put food on the floor and walk out of the room, eventually that dog is going to eat the food because he's a dog. That's what they do. They're ruled by passions and urges, but we have been freed for them, so now we can live for the will of God, not the will of the flesh, not the will of our passions. 
He goes on to say this in verse 3. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debaucheries and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So he gives and he lists all these things that you were slave to if you were slave to your passions, if your passions rule over your life. And these are the things that we've been liberated from. Can we fall back in them? Sure. Can we stumble back in them? Sure we can. And we do. Only difference is now you're free to choose. Now you're free to repent when you mess up. Now you have the strength to lift yourself up when you go wrong, inevitably, as we all do. And it's grace that's given you this opportunity. It is grace that has given you this gift, first, of your freedom and your liberation. And Peter urges you, this is a gift. Use it well. This is a gift of grace. Steward it as it is meant to be used. And so Peter then starts to lay out, how do we steward this grace? How do we live now under grace and not under the dominion of our passions? And he begins in verse 7. He says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Because the first way we steward our grace that God has given us, be self-controlled and sober-minded. Okay, another way of saying it is to have discipline. Okay, that's how we control ourself. That's how we get to tell ourselves what to do and what not to do. And as soon as you're free from those passions and and freed in Christ, now we get that self-control that we don't have any other way. Now we have been able to have this opportunity for freedom. Because you think without self-control, without any of that self-discipline, we just run after, well, whatever desire comes in our head. Oh, this looks good. I'll go for that. Oh, I like this one now. I'm going to go for that. Oh, oh, well, this one looks better today. And we're just bouncing around in our life with, with no direction, with no purpose, with no control. Without self-control, the possibility of discernment is impossible. Without self-control, we can't even ask the question, is this a good idea for my life? Is this something that I should be doing? Is this something that I should be engaging in? You've got to have self-control even to begin to ask that questions, to make the choices, to choose the right over the wrong. To steward the grace God has given you. You first need self-control. And if you sit back and think about it, if you don't have self-control, then who does have control? If you're not controlling yourself, who is controlling you? Because if you don't have self-control, someone or something else is the one calling the shots in your life. And when that happens, it's usually, almost always, not in your best interest. So self-control, first way we steward the grace God has given us, self-control. The next way, looking at verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. This one is no surprise, right? The way we steward grace is we love one another. Love is the law. Love is the essence of God's character. Love is the essence of grace itself. It's because of love that God gave us grace. It's because of love that that He forgave us and gave us all these these second and third and fourth and thousandth chance that we get at life to be good people. It's because of love He's done that, so it makes sense that the best way to steward that grace and to show the gratitude for that grace is to love one another. So it's the same love that God has given us to all of our brothers and sisters, to our neighbor, even to our enemy. And notice it says love earnestly. Right, it says love earnestly. That means love for real. No, no fake love. No just show love. No just saying you love. 
Okay, you can't say bless your heart and then talk about them behind their back. All right? Earnest love. And it comes with this beautiful assurance. It says, because love covers a multitude of sins. I mean, that's a great comfort because, I mean, we can't ever make up for our sins, right? We, we can't earn our salvation. It says, but if we can even come close to doing that, it's by loving one another. It says love covers a multitude. It, says it doesn't cover all your sins. You can, you can love and you're going to still need Jesus, but it can cover some sins and it can cover even a lot. Peter says a multitude of sins. If, there, if there's any way we can come close to balancing the ledger of our sins or having some of them stricken off our record by our own effort, it's only through love. Only through love. It can cover a lot of your sins, a whole multitude. Not all, but a lot. And of course, when he says love, it doesn't mean just your kids or your friends or your family or the people you like. We have to remember what Christ told us. We have to love our neighbor, no matter how annoying our neighbor might be. We even have to love our enemy. Great way to steward your grace. Love one another. And then he says this in verse 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Here is another great way to steward your grace. Because hospitality itself is kind of a model for grace. You, you invite a stranger or someone else into your home. And you, uh, and you give them the seat of honor. You entertain them. You feed them. You give them something to drink. You give them a place to stay. You don't make them clean anything up. I mean, it's just a great way to, I mean, that is the model of grace itself. Because God gave us all these things that we have without us earning them, without us deserving them. And so in hospitality, we're able to show a little bit of that in the same way. Invite a visitor, even a stranger, someone you don't know into your house, and you give them out of your abundance. I mean, what a great way to show grace. And of course, he says you have to do it without grumbling, right? Give hospitality without grumbling, right? That means, oh man, you see what Rob did? He ate all the potato salad, and he just he eats so much every time he comes to visit. He never offers to clean the dishes. I wouldn't make him do it anyway, but at least he should offer, shouldn't he? No, that kind of ruins the gift if you complain about it, right? You give hospitality without grumbling, without complaining about what it costs you because God has given you everything that we have without cost to us. And you should give it for no other reason. Is this a good Southern virtue, right? Hospitality is what us Southerners are supposed to be known for. And then finally, in stewarding the grace, he says this in verse 10. He says, as each has received a great a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So Peter says, use your gifts to serve one another. Use your gifts to serve one another. He says, you've all been given what he calls a varied grace. As God has given you his varied grace. Now, varied, he means different. As in, there's this grace that he has given to us in a different way. Now, there, there's three kinds of grace that I can identify throughout Scripture. Now, the first one's common grace. That's the grace given to every human being on this planet. Every human being receives the common grace grace of God, a blessing, right? They receive certain gifts. Every human being is God as part of God's common grace. Then there's saving grace. And saving grace is for God's elect. It's the grace that leads to salvation. And then finally, there's this what he calls varied grace. And varied grace is just like it sounds, is that everyone doesn't get the exact same type of grace. Right? It varies from person to person, from gift to gift, from individual to individual. And we've all been given this kind of grace in a different way. Some people have been given this grace as a gift of music. Some a gift of teaching. Some a gift of administration. Some have been given this very grace as a gift that they're really good at, at working with people. 
Some have this varied grace as a gift of healing. Some with building and working with their hands. Others in finance who've been given it as a grace to make money. I wonder what that's like. It must be nice. But we've been given a gift. You have been given a gift of God's varied grace, which means it's a unique gift. Other people might have a gift that's similar to it, or maybe even with the same name, but it's not exactly like the grace that God has given you. He's given you a grace, this very grace that is yours and yours alone. It's part of the relationship you have with God, and no one else is a part of it. It's one of the things that makes you a unique creation in our Lord. And there's a purpose behind the gift. There's a reason He is giving you that varied grace. Now, it's not uncommon that when we have a gift, what we do is we go make a living with it. Right? God has given us His gift and His talent, and we go out and we find a job that fits that gift or talent, and we make money with it. Some people make a whole lot of money with it. And that's fine. That's okay. That's one of the good uses that you should use God's gift for. But that's not the only one. It is, it is perfectly fine to take your gifts and to go make a living and to make money on it. But if that's the only thing you do with your gift, then you're not fulfilling its purpose. And what I mean by that is the reason God has given you your gift is to make a living, but that is not the purpose He has given you that gift for. It's okay to make a living with it. It's okay to make money with it, but that's not the only thing you should be doing with your gift. I'll give you back to verse 10 because he says, as each has received a gift, what does he say to do with it? Use it to serve one another. That's why he's giving you your gift. It's to serve one another. If you're only making money with your gift, you're not using it like it's supposed to be used. God gave you this gift to serve one another. And he also, if it says here in uh, verse 11, it says he's giving you this gift in order that in everything God may be glorified. To serve one another with your gift and to glorify God with your gift. That's why he gave it to you. He's giving you this good in your heart. You're supposed to take this good and you share this good with other people. Whatever it is, the good or the gift He's given you, and He has given you one, you're supposed to take it, and you're supposed to share it with other people. You're supposed to take it, and you're supposed to glorify God with the gifts He's been given you. And if all you're doing is making a living with it, if all you're doing is making money, you're not using it like it's supposed to be used. Your gift is to serve others, and it's to glorify God. Now, you might be wondering, where can I use my gift to serve others and glorify God? Is there such a place where I can go and use my unique gifts to serve others and glorify God? Well, if you're asking that question, I am so glad you asked it. Because there is a place that has been designed by God specifically for you to use your gifts to serve others and to glorify God. It's called the church. And we've got a way for you to use your gift to both serve others and glorify God. We have ministries we've designed specifically for that purpose, and you can sign up for them anytime you like and serve as for as long as you desire. And if you're wondering to yourself, well, I'm not sure where my gift fits in, come talk to me. We will figure it out. As a pastor friend of mine used to like to always say, God loves you, and I have a plan for your life. Welcome to Cherokee. So the question we all must ask ourselves is what have you done with the grace that God has given you? Now, I'm not saying that you've got to go out and earn your salvation because you can't do that. And I'm not asking you this to you to make you feel guilty. Well, maybe a little bit. I'm not throwing this out here to, to, to try to say you've got to go out and prove yourself to God. You've got to go do some mighty act to attract attention so, so God will see just how, how obedient you are. I'm just saying take your gift and use it in obedience and gratitude. Think back to that field. 
that vineyard we talked about at the beginning. That if you gave it to another person and you saw it fall into disuse, how would you feel about that gift? I'm willing to bet you would have thought you wasted that gift on a person who didn't use it for its intended purpose. Friends, let's be stewards of God's grace. Let's be stewards and use it well. He has given us this priceless gift and, he, and, and He's given it us that we can love one another. He's given you a unique gift so you can use it to serve one another and to glorify the name of your Savior. Now, if you're keeping track in your books and your little passports, our bit of advice for today from Peter is be stewards of God's grace. Or rather, be good stewards of God's grace. To steward that grace is to serve one another and gratitude and joy. To steward that grace is to bring honor and glory to the one who gave it to you. To make your life a service to others. To make your life a song of praise to God. For there is no better use of His amazing grace and there is no greater meaning to your life. To Him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen.